Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about what type of graph is best to represent your data. Now this video could be helpful for you if you're looking to figure out what type of graph you need to make for a particular data set, or if you just want some practice on graphing basics, especially for a science class. You may be familiar with different types of graphs, but given a set of data, do you know which graph is best to represent that data? As it turns out, there is often a right type of graph choice when you have specific kinds of data sets. In this video, we'll introduce some graphing tips, talk about how and when to choose the right type of graph for your data, and go over a few examples of data sets and practice figuring out the best type of graph for that data. The more practice you get graphing, the better you are going to get at recognizing different graph shapes and patterns. Some graphs can help us understand how systems and organisms function. Others can help us figure out cause and effect relationships. If we look at our examples here, these are some very basic graphs but this first one is what we call a bell curve and that's usually associated with a normal distribution or a random sample of data. A curve like this, which is sometimes called a J curve, is usually associated with some sort of exponential growth like bacterial growth in an early stage. This S-shaped curve that sort of levels out after a while is usually associated with a population that's reached its carrying capacity. We also call this logistic growth. And then when we see a graph go up and down like this and we get a sine-like wave, sometimes that could represent some sort of biological rhythm or fluctuation. The more you see different graph types and the more practice you get graphing, the more you'll be able to recognize some of these patterns for yourself. So let's get back to the basics. When you're making a graph, you need to make sure you include a few very important things. Besides deciding the right type of graph to represent your data, always include a title that's very descriptive of your graph. Don't just say experiment or lab. Talk about what you're actually measuring in your title. Then make sure you have axis labels and units for those axes. Especially if you're graphing numerical data on that axis, you want to make sure, for example, the leaf mass is shown in grams here and the time is shown in minutes at the bottom. You want to make sure you have an appropriate scale for your graph. You don't want all of your graph to be squished up into one corner of your graph. You want it to fill up the space that you have as best you can. Next, if you need a legend to represent different categories or colors, make sure you include that on your graph as well. And if any error bars are necessary, be sure to include those. I'll have a whole other video on error bars, which we're not going to get into today, but if you're interested in learning more on those, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the content on my channel. So we're going to go over some of the most common types of graphs that a science student might need to recognize and know how to graph. There's plenty of other graph types, but we're just going to go over these basic ones today. These are some of the most common ones that you might see for graphing data for experiments. First of all, a line graph you've probably seen before is usually a graph that's used for change over time, usually with one numerical factor. From here we can see any sort of increase or decrease in a particular behavior or whatever we're measuring for our experiment. There are other times we'd use a line graph too, but if it's any sort of change over time, you probably want to choose line graph. A scatter plot represents two data points together. For example, books read in a year with your GPA. We can also draw trend lines on scatter plots, which if you're doing by hand, try to get the same number of points below the line as you have above the line, and then see if there's any sort of trend that appears within the data. A bar graph is a graph that a lot of students are very familiar with, and this is when we're comparing different categories. And a lot of biological experiments will also see error bars on bar graphs. If you didn't calculate these or your data set does not display these, you don't need to include them. A pie chart is also a graph that a lot of students are familiar with, but it's usually not one of the graphs that's going to be the most helpful for biologists. A pie chart is used when showing portions of a whole, usually adding up to 100%. So for example, showing the different components of your blood. In this case, this pie chart is showing the approximate composition of the air by different gases. Notice all the sections of the pie add up to 100%. A histogram is a graph that sometimes can look like a bar chart that is squished together. But usually we're going to use a graph like this to show how variable the data are. We can be looking at range, distribution, or mean. You've probably seen a histogram before if you've ever looked at population graphs or population charts, where we see the frequencies or the numbers of males and females in different age groups in a particular country. This is a population chart for the DRC. So let's do a little practice. I'm going to describe a different type of data on each slide, and you're going to try to guess what type of graph would be best for that data. Now, you can argue different types of graphs for any of these data sets, but I've chosen the one that I think would be the most appropriate for each particular situation. Let's start with this one. The number of bird species collected in five different locations. Think about it for a minute. A bar graph would probably be appropriate in this scenario. Because we're comparing different categories, our five different locations, and one numeric factor, the number of bird species, we could make five different bars for our locations and then graph each bar with the number of species in each location. The next one is the number of germinated seeds each day over a 10-day period. Think you know? 
The hint here is time. So because we're looking at a 10 day period, we're probably gonna be using a line graph to demonstrate change over time. For this one, bacteria species present in one sample of soil, think about it. You might wanna choose a pie chart in this case. You could talk about all the different species and then graph them by percent on your pie chart, seeing which species add up to the largest percentages on your pie chart. Hours playing video games versus age. Here, because we're looking at two different numeric factors together, you're probably gonna to wanna to choose scatter plot. Now let's see the height of a child over a five year period. What do you think? You guessed it, that change over time is gonna be a line graph. Now the type of cancer versus the number of cases this year. Well, the type of cancer could be our categories and the number of cases is a numeric factor. So we would probably choose a bar graph to compare these different categories together. Our moose population over 100 years, in this case, we'd be looking at a line graph. I hope this was helpful for you in figuring out what type of graph would be best for your data set. What other questions do you have about graphs? Let me know in the comments below. If this video has been helpful, make sure to give it a like and subscribe for more resources. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you later.